Hi everyone, thank you so much for uh, joining us on our session today, which is Music Documentaries, New Forms and Platforms. Um, welcome to Sheffield. So over the past few years, we've enjoyed an exciting shift in the world of music documentaries. From 20,000 Days on Earth to Amy, to works like Lemonade and Process by Khalil Joseph, it feels like fact and fiction are coming together in innovative new ways. At the same time, the digital space has allowed musicians to become more experimental with how they choose their stories. Platforms like Noisy, The Fader, and YouTube have really been at the forefront of this movement, and more importantly, work with brands that have trusted them to move away from the conventional profile film format. So we're joined today by a wonderful panel of filmmakers and execs who have, and still are, playing a vital role in developing films and driving creativity in this space. Today we're going to talk about some of their favourite projects and experiences making music docs, looking at the future of the form and how to get them made. So, just short introductions from our esteemed panel. If we could start with Rollo. Hi, uh, I'm Rollo, Rollo Jackson, and I work as a director, and I make amongst documentaries, music videos, and commercials as well. Uh, Alex Hoffman, I'm head of video at Vice, but i um, been there eight years, but for most of my time now, I focus mainly on Noisy, which is our music channel. Hi, I'm Jackie Edenbrow. I'm head of video at Freeze, and I've got a background in music, feature documentaries for cinema and broadcast. Hi, I'm Robert Summer. I uh, am a director, producer, and creative director I work in advertising, and previously I was the head of content at The Fader. Thank you very much. So I guess I'd like to talk a little bit more, uh, or to start with, about the format. So what things, the films that we all make, and what that looks like and feels like, as opposed to where they live or who's paying for them. So um, I thought we could perhaps show some clips and then talk about how these films creatively came about. So we're going to start off with the... Uh, music, I don't know, here, you know, video project that you would say, Stormzy Gang Signs and Prayer, that Rollo Jackson made with uh, the grime artist Stormzy. Um, if we could show that clip, please. That would be great. Thank you. So this trailer here is um, for a much longer piece, about 15 minute short film that uh, Rollo directed and Rob at the time you were working at the Fader, so you had quite a lot to do with that coming together. I guess, in the instance, uh, how do you, how are you trying to challenge the traditional format of a, of a music fil film? What does that really mean, a music documentary? Or? Well, I guess just to put in a bit of context, I'd already worked with Stormzy about a year or so before that and made a shorter piece, which was um, actually kind of the extension of a kind of Adidas campaign, which turned out to be a kind of seven five, six-minute film, which featured small moments of him performing um, amongst him kind of talking, much kind of tr fairly tr sort of traditional documentary format with a little bit of music in between it. And then um, sort of fast forward a year later and I'd been in his studio and listening to his music and, and seeing him work there. And so I had quite a good handle on kind of what the album was about and where the music was going. And... Luckily enough, I got a call from Fader, who I'd been trying to work with, and we'd been trying to come up with various projects for a while, um, and nothing had quite settled. And they had this, this essentially, I mean, they had this pot of money, and they were like, do you want to make a film? Uh, after having kind of n not found anything else until the time, and I said, yes, of course, I'd love to. Um, have you heard of this guy Stormzy? Of course they had. And it sort of went on from there in terms of getting it commissioned, although it was quite a long process. But um, I think, to go back to a question about formats, it was, I wanted to ex extend the sort of ideas I'd done in the first film. Mm. So they're kind of hybrid things. So rather than doing kind of music videos, which I've done quite a lot of um, and still enjoy, I wanted to make something a bit kind of heavier and a bit, a bit kind of weightier. Um, I didn't really want to get into the zone where he was acting in it. Yeah. But obviously it was very important that his voice his voice kind of metaphorically as well as literally was, was in it and that the film was a sort of reflection of what the album was about so I kind of took it from there to make a film that was that basically a sort of reflection of the album but not not just a straight narrative and a reflection on perhaps his life too and he, how collaborative yeah I mean I guess that? if you take that the album yeah. is, is a reflection of his own life as well yeah. So, yeah. Um, great and we'll probably come to talk a bit more about how that was made later on um, but to continue with our clips, Jackie Edenbrow, you have made 
very, very many beautiful films in your time, but um, we're about to see a new project that came out only a couple of weeks ago with um, artist Wu, Wu Sun. Wu Sun, um, yeah. And this is a film for Gucci and Freeze. Thank you. So that's a real sort of beautiful burst of color and uh, music and art. And I guess when you see a film like that, which is part of a bigger series, I, I, I think, um, or trailer, you know, the form is under, uh, undefinable in many ways. So uh, it would be interesting to find out a little bit more about uh, the artist and what this film is meant to do, or if it had a remit, I guess. So yeah, I mean, this artist, she's made, she made a film um, about a bar in LA called The Silver Platter. Um, and it's, it was very much kind of safe haven for the LGBTQ community since the 70s. And I saw that a few years ago and then was reminded of it when I was looking for artists to make films for this series. Because essentially it's a series that celebrates the 30th anniversary of rave, um, the rave movement and Acid House. And we're looking at all the different genres and sounds that um, and spirits that informed and led um, to Acid House and Rave. So um, we spoke to Wu about her interest in making film about New York House and the underground and, you know, and accessing that community. Um, and she was, you know, she was um, really interested. It was difficult to kind of work it into her schedule, but we found a way. And, you know, she, she for her, she, she kind of, all of her films are, um, I guess, what you call magical realist um, films. And they, this one in particular, um, it was very much about the origins um, and, I guess, evolving spirit of New York House and the underground. And she didn't want to make a film that was about a specific kind of genre or sound. For her, um, she really what was important was synthesizing the spirit of it um, and playing with form in order to realize that. Um, and so what you can see in that clip is um, essentially... Um, a couple of vignettes, um, which are kind of quite surreal vignettes, um, and they're based around a collection of oral histories that she collected from, from her cast. So a cross-generational cast, performers, DJs, clubbers that were there in the 70s, going to Loft, Paradise Garage, right way through ballroom culture and kiki culture, and um, voguing up to the present day with like clubs like Ghetto Gothic. And so she cast mm. from, a, from, you know, cross-generational. And, but in terms of how she used those testimonies and those kind of real life experiences. Um, she wanted to mix them up so that you weren't really sure who was talking about what um, to really blend past, present and near future. So that rather than thinking about specific clubs and scenes and times and places, um, she was very much trying to articulate a spirit. Mm. Um, and that spirit is very much what the film is about thematically mm. and that spirit I guess, um, is very much about resistance through art and culture and mm. reinvention, how important the club is to yeah. that, um, how it was important back in the day and it's just, just yeah. as important now, with you know, so many spaces being gentrified out of, um, out of existence. Yeah. Um, well, that's, uh, I, th I couldn't agree more, and I think that spirit of, of music and the club and the, the physical space and the subcultures that used to exist are, you know, what has been behind so many amazing music, music documentaries that we've seen over the years. And now we're living in a time perhaps where subculture is more difficult to define. They do exist, but perhaps they um, make it on the, you know, everything happens in real time on the internet in many ways. So we're not discovering about a club or a scene that was in New York in, as we did in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, and that leads me on to Alex Hoffman, who um, runs things at Noisy. And you have a beautiful um, film about Birmingham. And I really uh, think that this, uh, this film, which is a half an hour doc on noisy.com, really encapsulates how we, we can feel that there's no subcultures happening, perhaps, or that music is uh, less of a scene and less of a magic that it had uh, that we can be nostalgic about. But really, it is still happening, and people are still coming together, and it is regenerating. And there's a whole generation of kids making new music and coming together in that way so um yeah we, 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 should, yeah. we, we um this one was quite an easy one to commission in a way because we've been talking to um, mike skinner who hosted it for quite a while before that and he's always been 
He's from Birmingham, and he's been super passionate about it. And even when it wasn't, the artists weren't at the level that they're at now. He's so passionate about supporting them, and he's sort of helped quite a few of them. Um, so he really wanted to do it, and it just got to the point where we're like, yeah, we should do this, we should do this. As soon as we get some time, we should do it. And then as we were sort of discussing it, they just seemed to be getting bigger and bigger mm. until there was sort of almost the worry that like, they're going to get too big and we won't actually be able to get any of them. Um, so in that way, it was, it was, it was quite an easy one. So and, maybe um, we should see the clip Yeah, let's do that. Uh, Birmingham Noisy. So it's obviously we, we only have time to watch short clips today, but that's um, a half an hour of, of show, and we, through the lens of music, really find out a lot more about Birmingham and about where the kids are from. And um, I, you were quite inspired by, I guess, another film when you were watching that, or if you want to talk more. Yeah, well, I guess over the years we've done quite a, quite a lot of documentaries and music documentaries, quite a lot of ones which are noisy and the name of a town. Obviously in the States they've done Atlanta and... Chicago and all of those. And it's great when people come up to you and say, like, oh, your films are really different, but then the worry is that your films are maybe different to other outlets, but then you don't want to then become formulaic within your own form. Um, so we're always, like everyone, I guess, looking to push it and do, do different things. And um, it's not like no one's ever done this, but yeah, I was inspired by a, f a film that um, is from, I think, the late 80s, which is about Liverpool and involves some of my favorite bands. And it was, it was a French production, but it was the way that they put it together. I mean, first of all, the interviews were really uh, nicely done. They never felt like really sit-down interviews. Like with the artists, they were more, um, I don't know, they were really intimate. And you probably have to, you should definitely hunt it out on YouTube. It looks really old. It's eight, late 80s, but because it, it's sort of been passed down from hand to hand, it looks like it's from the 1800s or something. <laughs> but um, that stuff was really nice. But what, what more grabbed my attention was the sort of slice of life stuff in between that, um, the clip we've just seen, that's obviously two MCs either side, but the guys in the middle aren't MCs, they're just people from Birmingham. And we just wanted to find a way to bring in, to just make the, the city the, the main character of the film. It's not just artist, artist, artist. You know, mm. let's interview a rapper, interview a rapper, interview a rapper, and then put it together and hope people like it. Just try and give a sense of, of the city. And I really like the way they did that in that film, that it wasn't set up. It wasn't like, right, now we're going to go and meet so-and-so. It would just pop up. And like at first, I guess people were a bit like, well, aren't we going to set this up? Or are people not going to be weirded out? And I was like, well, I don't, think, I don't think they will be. I don't think people are, uh, are like that. They can't accept that something will just appear on their screen that hasn't been completely uh, you know, dictated to them what it is. So we, we, we tried it, and, um, and I think it really enriched the film and mm. so hopefully brought in people that are maybe from Birmingham. You know, the nicest thing was that we, we did the premiere in Birmingham. We did a London one as well, but the first one ever was in Birmingham. And it really felt like the people in the audience were really proud because you know they, they don't get as many things you know in london we can get quite jaded with 10 screenings every night mm. of various things but um yeah hopefully a lot of people there felt really really proud and they're having such a good moment music wise that i think they thought it was nice that it was recognized so that crudely cuts into the 15 minute episode <laughs> um but if you could tell us a little bit because that is a it's a it's a series and it looks narrative but yeah, so behind. I think that's an example of sort of pushing documentary as far as it can go, and obviously it's gone into sort of a scripted world, but I met these, this group of skaters uh, in North Hollywood, and immediately I sort of became obsessed with just their whole world, and I, you know, I'm a grown man, but I was following around a bunch of 18-year-olds. Uh, skate. Yeah, boys <laughs> trying to skate and be cool like them, and uh, I knew immediately that I, just because they were... Rarely you, you meet just one amazing character, but all of them are really interesting and cool in their own way, and I knew that I wanted to make a film project with them. And these kids, is like the Tyler, the Creators crew, is that right? Yeah, they, they have a T-shirt? Yeah, I met, them, I met them through through Tyler and them, and you know they're just sort of all these skaters that hang out with him on Fairfax or like around his store. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I knew I wanted to make a, a film project with them, and they already make like their own sort of skate videos at home that I was really into, and they're they're really well done. But when it, when we started talking about it, I think I didn't want to make a traditional documentary or something that was around skateboarding in general. So when we really started talking, uh, we came up with this idea like, what if we, you know, everybody's a non-actor and everybody is doing this for the first time. So I, we thought of just like, what if we took your reality and sort of just put some shape around it and sort of tried to do it, like took your stories that really happened and everybody plays themselves. No one's an actual character. Everybody's a non-actor. Those are all locations and places that mm. they hang out all the time. So the idea was to 
take to pluck things from their real life and then try to put some shape around it and, mm -hmm. and, and see what that would feel like as like a scripted show, right? So like you said, this is just a two minute clip of one episode. Each episode's about 15 minutes long and there's five episodes in total and we're, the third one's just about to be released on the fader. Um, but yeah, I think like this really blurs the lines between sort of scripted and and documentary in a really interesting and weird way. Like again, like I said, like everybody's playing themselves and they all hang out every day in real life. And a lot of the scenes aren't. There was not a lot. Of, there wasn't a script written. There was more like we came up with a series of scenes mm. and then everything would sort of be improvised on the spot. And you really get to know those characters. And I, I guess in terms of uh, the the music element, that's it's it's a more honest slice of what it's really like to be a young musician or in that type of world as opposed to anything that could be uh, just sort of filmed and shaped. Um, I guess that kind of, with all of these films, it's a real blurring of, and it feels like things are uh, becoming very ex more experimental and that platforms actually are taking risks to become more experimental. So for the fader, you know, pitching that in, it's quite a wild uh, commission quite a big budget, it's beautifully shot, and you don't really know what's going to come about. So how did that kind of work with them, but uh, where do you think that this type of, do you think this will be picked up by anyone else, or? I mean, yeah, I mean, we're, we've, we're actually uh, in negotiations right now to try to take this to a larger sort of platform and try to bring it to actual linear television. There's been a lot of interest in it, and I'm, I mean, as far as getting the commission, I think it helps that when you can attach people like Tyler, the creator, to it, yeah. or Frank Ocean to it, uh, who were both part of it <laughs> musically and also like on an executive creator sort of level, or executive producer level, rather. But uh, I think it's just a lot of trust, you know? Like you have to, people have to, you know, know who the, the sort of key players are in it and, and have to put a lot of trust in them that, you know, because you're right on paper, it does seem a little abstract. Like, oh, it's not a documentary, but it's not a mm. scripted film. It's, it's just these teenagers. We're gonna follow them around. We're gonna improvise some scenes, and hopefully, it all edits together at the end. Uh, that's hard to. That's hard, <laughs> hard to, to sell in. That's hard to get people <laughs> to give you money to do that. Uh, obviously, so I think what it comes down to, a, a, in this case, certainly, is that. Uh, you just have to trust the people involved and know that you know. And I think that's a big thing. Like I've. In my time, when uh, I've been on both sides directing and commissioning, when I commission, I really trust, you know, whether that's like Rolo's film, like The Gang Signs of Prayer, like I know his relationships with Stormzy and I know what he's capable of. So it's a matter of like, you know, his, his, uh, his treatment for Gang Signs of Prayer as well. Like, you know, for, your, for most people, it'd be hard to imagine what it's like. He, there's, ra there's music video Something's parts, there's happen. documentary parts, there's scripted parts. So, Again, it just comes down to, I think, a lot of just trusting the people who are involved and knowing you know, the level of work that they can make. It does feel that this space is way more interesting in terms of experiment experimenting than uh, the traditional like, music video as well. And I wonder if you guys are really, you know, I know this is a question that gets asked, but is the music video redundant now? And do artists want to work in different ways where they t tell their own story, not just through the lens of what a director feels, I guess? Well, that's a question for you. Why did Stormzy want to get away from? Um, well, I don't think music videos are redundant at all. I think they're lots of fun. Um, I think they're good. I think all of these things can kind of live together. Mm -hmm. I think, that, you know, you can't really kind of simplify the world to say, well, music just needs music videos or, or just documentaries about those artists as, as real people, not their artist names. Um, I think... I think a big part of it is, is really how much the artists have got to say as well. And I think you can only really, you know, the, crucially, I think, and it's funny now because there's lots of um, just looking at that screen and seeing things like fire, names like Fire Pit and stuff like that and, and Warners and, and labels are now super, super keen to push all of this content about their artists. And it's funny because you go in and have chats with them and I'm like, well, it's only going to be as good as the musicians, really. Um, I think, or as good as the music. Uh, so I think with, with going back to what Rob was saying, a, a huge amount of it is about trust and about if you know, you know, I wouldn't have suggested making that type of film that I did with Stormzy, maybe, or certainly not in that way, about another artist. Mm. I think it has to be very specific to that person. And I'm, you know, what Rob's just shown is a very good example of, of it, that being intrinsically linked to the, 
to the artist that he was working with. Um, and I think, yeah, trust. You know, Stormzy, I'd, like, I'd done a couple of things with him already, and it was quite a weird period when we made that film because he was kind of getting exponentially more famous um, and busy, basically. So for a long build-up to that film, I mean, Rob, remember, we didn't have a huge amount of contact with him, and I was like, I've got this idea, and he was basically, okay, cool, go with it. Which is nice, but it's also quite risky, alarming when it's you know a lot, a lot of money yeah. that that you're committing to to a very specific idea and a, committing to a narrative as well. So if they then turn around and are like, yeah, I don't really like it, then yeah, you're a bit screwed. Um, but luckily he he did, and he was he kind of backed it and was very much into it. So, and I guess you've really touched upon um, you know these new commissioners within the space. So. Record labels have looked at their rosters and realized that there's lots of stories to be told with the amazing back catalogs that they have, or they're trying to make yeah. an artist really, really big. However, as we kind of know, not all artist stories are that interesting, and what works to listen to as a record doesn't always translate to a great film. So um, it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about that, actually. I'm currently working a little bit at Warner Music, where they have an incredible back catalog and um, are looking to do new formats around it. Uh, BMG and Sony have recently uh, produced two films. One is the Wiley biopic, which doesn't star Wiley, but it's a narrative um, version of his life. Uh, it's a, a feature, lo uh, feature doc film. I think he thinks he's in it. I th he, According to Twitter, he's oh, does he? be excited about being in Maybe it. Maybe he'll turn <laughs> up one or two days. <laughs> um, and then... Well, they've done something amazing with the Trojan Records back catalogue. So um, BMG and Pulse are making a film called Rude Boy, which is telling the story of Trojan Records, uh, which was you know, an amazing label in London in the 70s and 80s, the Windrush generation coming through. But that's a real hybrid type film. But these new commissions are coming uh, in, or the opportunity is there. But the relationship with talent is always the, the key to if it's good or not, or if it's interesting or not, really. Yeah. Um, well, the Wiley thing, also, I think, is, sorry to sorry, is, yeah. is Pulse affiliated as, as well, I believe. Yeah. So if there's a company like that involved, then I would have confidence that it could be. I mean, no disrespect to what you guys are doing, but I, I'm never that sure if it's fully coming from a label, especially with a new artist, how, how good, sort of in a pure way, a, a documentary piece can be. Sometimes it can be good for sort of promoting an artist, mm. but I think generally they can be quite different than, say, what... Or, or, or noisy does, and very, very rarely it'll get something that I would get that excited about because it often just feels like a, um, a promotional or an piece. But yeah, but not always, and I'm sure there's room for that to change. Yeah. The other thing is that <laughs> is that everyone's very obsessed with ep episodic content mm. at the moment. I love I, it. And I keep on getting, it's like, oh, do you want to do like a series about this, or like, can you come up with a series about that? And personally, I think, I mean, sometimes that does work very well. Um, and I think of, I'm talking about music documentaries, for instance, I think I'm sure lots of people here have seen it, that Defiant Ones oh, documentary, which was, yeah. which, which was very good. We think of, the, you know, the extent of the archive that they, that they had, that they paid for, was kind of incredibly deep and very good. But even that, which I think was only four episodes, sort of tailed off a little bit. Also the, the, the last episode was mainly about Beats by Beats by, <laughs> by Jay. Yeah, so. which is arguably less interesting. <laughs> Part of the story. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, My favourite episode. But sometimes I think, you know, it is about the artist and it is, it is you know, like I'd, I'd probably a person who'd rather see a kind of one-off film if it's about an artist rather than mm. something that's strung over lots of episodes. And I think that's not a gripe exactly, but that's one thing that people have, it's a sort of, it's very on vogue or it's like a trend at the moment that is, works for some things, but I think is not, you know, pit, use it when it's the right thing to do, I think. I agree, and it's because the commissioners or the brands or the channels want return, uh, return viewers and more subscribers, and I feel that that's why they're also commissioning um, documentaries around a talent that has a massive influence and loads of Instagram followers, as opposed to telling um, an interesting story. Yeah. I mean, like, talent and catalogue films can be amazing, but, you know, music and society can't be separated. So, you know, looking at social and political narratives through the lens of music can be a really interesting way to approach it. You know, but also I've made films um, which are, you know, purely record label commissioned projects. Like I did a film about Depeche Mode, um, celebrate their 25th anniversary, anniversary, which was, I think, 
it was a long time ago now, 12 years ago, but um, you know, that was commissioned by the, by the label and it didn't feature the band at all. You know, the, um, the artist who directed it, Jeremy Della, um, Turner Prize winning artist, his pitch was, you know, I want to make a film that doesn't feature the band. And, um, you know, he, he wanted to celebrate the work, that the, the art that the fans create, mm. how they appropriate the music to create their own um, art. And I think we can see a clip of it, actually. Oh, amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So absolutely an amazing film, um, really fun, and uh, I guess, as you say, a label 12 years ago commissioned that to <laughs> celebrate the Depeche Mode, so there are still these opportunities, but I guess now more and more, um, I guess, artists and brands are working together very closely, as they always have done, but on these sort of film projects, so with brands becoming commissioners in their own right, um, with, you know, I guess, Gucci uh, commissioning to work art films for freeze and kind of creating culture themselves. How do you find that works with the creativity of what you get to commission? Um, how, how is that different from, from this? And that, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, the press, I mean, actually, Der Jeremy's directing one of these films for this series oh, as well about Acid House. Um, it'd be interesting to ask him how, you know, but actually, I think it's, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no difference, um, in my, in my opinion. I mean, it depends on the brand, obviously. But you know, Gucci is at, at the helm. It has a creative director who's an artist himself, and so that kind of permeates, mm. you know, the, the brand's culture and DNA. And um, you know, the artists that we're working with have been given complete creative control to make the work they want to make, and Amazing. and they're very meaningful in a very meaningful work, meaningful way. Um, and also to be able to, you know, commercially exploit that work, but also use it as part of their portfolio. Mm. Um, because all of the artists that have been commissioned, um, it, the work is very much a natural progression of their body mm. of work. So, you know, Jeremy's made the Acid Brass project, um, where he got brass bands to play Acid House. Um, and Arthur Jaffa has made a film about techno. Amazing. Um, so they are creating, they are allowing this to happen, yeah, and creating culture. Yeah, I guess exactly. in terms of... Um, Brands coming on board to pay for uh, pay for work that you want to make. So, Rollo, you recently uh, made a film about the producer Scott Storch. Yeah. Um, and I, who who paid for that? Or was Vivo that a, did. that was a Vivo um, commission? So I guess we could see a quick clip of Scott Storch, please. Which comes out really soon. Is that right? In about a month, I think. Okay. So um, it's a, an amazing film about Scott Storch and. I guess what's interesting is that uh, if you mentioned the Defiant Ones, mm. here we have labels creating content, making music. So uh, uh, are they always the best placed to do that? Or do the artists, uh, should they choose who they work with themselves? Like, I mean, this was a bit of a funny one because this had been a film that I'd wanted to make for about four years. Mm. And it took a long time to get hold of him uh, despite me emailing info at Scott Storch for quite a long time. <laughs> um, he didn't reply. Uh, it, no, it took a long time to get hold of him because of what he was going through in his, his personal life. And then um, it, Vivo paying for it was actually quite unlikely and quite outside of their remit and, and, and what they do. And in fact, they have now had a kind of complete internal restructuring and aren't going to make any more films like that at all um, because of Google. Um, so you got the last, last bit. Of yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I was, I, was, I was quite lucky. Yeah, Kristen only. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> <I'm> paid. <laughs> um, actually, I haven't. Um, so, so this was a bit of a one-off, and it wasn't mm. really a kind of uh, catalogue. I mean, Vivo as well are quite a kind of weird entity themselves, and mm. I think as everyone here is like, we all know what Vivo is. You see it on artists' YouTube channels, but I don't really know what it does beyond that either. Um, Mate, don't slag him off if you haven't been paid. <laughs> um, but this was, so this was more of a kind of personal project that yep. luckily someone at Vivo um, had to spend some money by the end of a financial year and, and asked me if I wanted to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> I romantic. love those friends. That's yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. But it meant that, I don't know, in a weird way, they didn't really have anything invested in it other than, hey, let's make a film 
Um, it wasn't. It wasn't. It's not promoting anything. It's not promoting. So it's what sits in quite a weird space. It's not promoting an album. He's not even an artist at the front of at the front of kind of music. He's sort of very much behind the scenes. He's quite a sort of shy person, and he's probably much more known to older generation than Vivo are trying to hit. You know, he's not a sort of a kind of a kind of younger artist. So, so I was, I was very lucky in that respect. And how common is it to have a sort of passion project and or idea that you take to a brand that they want to pay for, or is it more often the brand want something made and you create to fit them? It's both, isn't it? I mean, with it's it's um you know more often than not it's the brand with with a brief that's pretty bad. <laughs> Um, you know, quite in all, in all honesty, I think that you know to take the creative conversation to the brand is is perhaps the, the better way to go. You know, especially if you've got something very you know you're you're very clear about what it is that you want to make, and you know just find the right brand to collaborate with. Um, I think is can be more fruitful. I mean, like with with the Gucci project. You know, with, they'd made that amazing campaign with um, Glenn, Glenn Lutchford, you know, the Northern Soul mm. um, film. So, you know, they obviously want... It was kind of obvious they wanted to place themselves at kind of the centre of key cultural moments in music. Mm. And so, you know, with, it, with us at House, the anniversary, and, you know, I had a few films that I really wanted to make. Yeah. They just seemed like the perfect partners yeah. to take it to, and they were really excited about it, you know, immediately. And, Rob, I guess, you know, you've, been, you've worked with... Vivo, YouTube, um, Apple are a brand. How has your experience been working on branded content and do you see a difference or, or not? I mean, these days, I think, you know, even five years ago, branded content was, you know, a, a, thing. a thing, right? And like, you know, you could make this, this documentary about an artist, but you had to cram a Volvo in there somewhere or you had to like, you know, they all had to be sipping Heineken's at one scene or something. But I think... Now, I think brands are finally coming around to seeing the value of just being involved with the project. And like if, you know, good examples are like, you know, if you saw the stuff Mercedes did this year with ASAP Rocky, or if you've seen like, even, you know, it's not a secret, but if, you've, if any of you have seen like the major laser in Cuba feature length film, that was, that was paid for by Pepsi, but you would never, their name's not even in the credits. There's, there's no Pepsi being drank by Diplo in any of the, of the film or anything. So I think, they're just, I think brands are finally realized just being associated with, you know, amazing films and stuff it gets them as much sort of uh, real estate or, or it gets people just as excited as if, you know, you're forcing, you know, I think people these days, like, authenticity is a big buzzword, right? But mm -hmm. I think it's really hard to sell to this generation, harder than any other generation before. And if they, they feel like they're being sold to, it turns them off very quickly. And I think, you know, for brands, they're starting to realize that, like, you can't force things on people like you could even 10 years ago. So just being involved is, uh, is, is better. And, and kids, just by association, I think, you know, younger people today, you know, like if you look at someone like Red Bull and all the great stuff they do in the music space, they're never forcing, they're not, you know, there's no cans anywhere or anything like that, but kids start to associate Red Bull authentically with music and with with great content as well. And so I think that goes a long way for people. And I think, so like, you know, stuff like that, like, I mean, I think the stuff that like, we worked on together, like with Stormzy again and stuff, and even like the Vivo thing, like you'll maybe see a, a, a title card at the beginning, but yeah. there's certainly no like moment where a kid logs on to YouTube and like, you know, you get to see the, the, the interface or something like that, you know? I think Red Bull's a really, really amazing model. And I mean, it's, it's the mainstream is always going to try and, you know, they have a need to cons consume cultural authenticity. But I think that if there's a genuine, you know, a genuine desire to create content that has genuine cultural impact and to, to create culture, then, you know, the content will reflect that. But it has to have that at its core. Yeah. Red Bull always comes up in these conversations because they're one of the few I guess that has really decided to go for something and stick with it mm. and invest in it every year and I know you could say argue that's easy because they've got so much money um, but still there's companies with loads of money I'm always surprised because I don't yeah. know who does drink Red Bull but well it's in every do. bar in the world I guess <laughs> they're, they're doing they're doing okay <laughs> but like they've just stuck with yeah something and, and, and I'm sure all of us and a lot of people in the audience will know that a lot of other brands they do change their mind or they have new people come in and they'll totally change their um, strategy which, which 
means it's just really difficult. But ultimately, I think, you know, back on what Rob was saying, like, brands also want views. You know, so everything is about views these days. Mm. And eventually, they're going to, you know, sort of realize, for example, with the stuff that we do, that we can make something that hits all of their sort of brand uh, points. You know, they'll have their sort of checklist of the sort of things that they want to hit. And we can make something, you know, we don't, but we could make something that was just like kind of for them, but people are not going to be passionate about it. They're not going to share it, right? Whereas they'll look at our own stuff and be like, oh, how come your guys are getting all these millions of views, but when we make this thing that ticks all our sort of brand guidelines, it, it doesn't. doesn't work. Yeah. So I think they realize that it's, you know, part of it is just like it doesn't have to, you don't have to have your brand everywhere, but not just you don't have to have it, you're not going to, you know, you're gonna, you, they, they've got to make the choice, basically. Do you want to get seen by this many people, but you're going to hit all of your brand guidelines and you'll see quite a lot of product? Mm. Or do you want to hit loads of people and some of those people might make the connection with your mm. brand? So the glorious future sort of looks like brands giving filmmakers and producers money to do what they want yes, with the artists who they want, regardless of how many Instagram followers they have. Depends sounds, on the brand. Sounds yeah. good. <laughs> no, um, Is there I mean, anything that you sort of, uh, that you've seen that you haven't made yourself, but you know, that you've seen recently in that space that you think, oh wow, I would love to work on something like that, or that's an amazing, that's a new model. How do we push this relationship forward, working with brands and channels? I mean, one thing I've, one thing I've worked on recently, just to make, make it all about me, yeah. um, <laughs> is, um, <laughs> is that with, with Gucci, I mean, they, they separated out the brand attribution, so it was like, okay, we'll make these stocks, we'll give the artist creative control freedom to make what they want, and then we'll have the branded film separate. So we created um, one, one branded film per documentary, and they're set, you know, the, um, these scenes and these, the, um, these genres are kind of the backdrop for the films, the 60 second, I call them films, they're 60 second commercials. Um, but, and within that, there's just a little story about the night, about nightlife. So one's about getting ready to go out, one's about going home alone, one's about just going crazy on the dance floor. We can show one if you want to see oh, it. So you yeah. can see how the, the brand attribution was actually um, contained how it rolled out. in the, the 60 second commercial, yeah. So where will they live? Will they go out on freeze.com? Yeah, freeze, um, Gucci, social digital channels. Um, the films will also um, be, we're doing a broadcast deal. Um, they'll be launched at Freeze Art Fair. And then also, um, they've been invited to screen at 180 The Strand mm -hmm. as part of um, a three-month uh, music, music and art exhibition. So that's that's the kind of distribution Amazing. side of it. And I guess what's interesting is that, that you're working with artists here as opposed to the musicians, and they're telling a kind of musical story that you know could, could be it's undefinable in in some ways. We were talking earlier, um, Rob and I, about artists and how some of them are good in camera and some of them are the, often the very popular people have less of a story. Um, but you have recently started working with artists direct, um, looking at how they create a brand or campaign around themselves. And I guess you're, it was just really interesting what you were talking about, how you work with different labels and different filmmakers and how you, will, how you think that could shape and change the way we commission. Yeah, I mean, I think that, so recently I've left the fader where I was for years to start an agency and a content studio that's uh, basically taking the best practices from the world of advertising and applying them to artists directly. And I've had this, idea, you know, just like a lot of people, but for me, I think the idea is based around that artists themselves are brands now. So like, you know, Tyler, who we were talking about from the film I showed, if you look at him, like, Music is just a small part of what he does. Like he has, he has his own festival. He has his own clothing line. He has, he don't, he does collaborations with other people's clothing. He tours. He makes content. So to me, he's more like a brand just within himself. So I, you know, I sort of put my bet on the artist, and I think that soon enough, you know, you know, no offense to all of us up here, but like I think that in the not so distant future, that things like noisy and fader and pitchforks of the world will be less important because the artists themselves will just start making the content and because be they have channel. their own distribution channels. If you look at someone like, you know, The Fader or something has, you know, almost a million subs on YouTube, but Migos has 10 million. Mm. So like why, 
I think it's the fader needs Migos a little bit more than the Migos need fader. And if they have the right people in their corner and the right people on their team to help them create content at the same level that other people are making content for them, I think that to me becomes a lot more interesting of an idea. And, and these artists becoming their own channels and becoming their own content sort of platforms, I think is, uh, is for me, I think is the future. And I, that's what I'm really, this business that I've started is really sort of betting on that, that, that they, we, in that Are you the labels, employ Alex Hoffman? Yeah, I'm, putting, I'm putting Alex out of Ready? business. Ready? Uh, no, but I think that with the, with the right people helping them that they won't need brands or platforms anymore. They'll just do it all themselves. Alex, how do you, you know, I would argue that the consumer always needs a, a, a trusted friend to guide us through the... Yeah, I don't, I don't think most of the big artists, they don't, they don't need us. Yeah. But quite often they enjoy working with us. They've got a lot of other things that they are working on. Um, so, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily see it that way. But in a way, both of those, those things are true. I'm, I don't take that as, a, as an insult. I think it's a really exciting time for art, especially like in the UK. I mean, the Stormzy film is probably a great example of how I feel like in the UK, A, people really, the word independence always going around, but it doesn't necessarily mean independent label or not signing to any label. They're just, there's a real spirit of trying to work across everything, like Rob was saying about being a brand. Mm. You know, they're just really excited about doing multidisciplinary stuff. And, um, and, this, and, and with that film, I feel like that was a really good example of how I feel like the UK music industry, um, especially with like rap and stuff, is quite competitive, but not in a sort of beef way. Where they seem like they're really supportive of each other, but they just really want to they'll see that and they'll be like, oh, I want to do, do, do something better. It feels yeah. like a really positive time for people seeing interesting stuff and, uh, and no one feels bound by these sort of strict rules. No one wants to sort of, you know, I think that's what they don't like about major labels. It's not like major labels are always bad, but they don't want to get a sheet of like everything you have to do to be an mm. artist and you've got to do it in this order and it's just like, why? Why Why do we have to do a music video for this one? Mm. Don't want to. Mm. Well, um, so that's really positive, I think. Yeah, and you know, I think increasingly brands need artists more than the other way around. So the power is shifting and hopefully creativity can be at the center. Yeah, I guess that's the only forward. sort of tricky thing with this sort of thing we're not really saying is that the, the, the brands really want the big, really cool artists and sometimes the money always gets funneled towards the, the highest echelons and they can basically say, well, we don't really need, we don't really need this money, but mm. we'll do it if you give us this, this and this. Mm. So it tends to be the massive artists, like, you know, there were rumours about what Apple Music were giving Frank Ocean, for that whole thing. Um, so that's the only concern. You want to just make sure that some of this brand money, as we're, as we're calling it, is, is getting to some Young artists. new artists Stamp. as well, yeah. Um, we're nearly time for questions, but I thought it would be nice to talk about things that we've enjoyed. So in the recent sort of last year or so, is there any piece of work that you've been really impressed by or that you've thought, I wish I made that? Or not even the last few years, what's your favourite, you know, what music documentary is it that you loved so much that you thought you wanted to do all of this? The Violent Ones. Yeah. yeah. Everyone's going to say that. I'm so <laughs> jealous. But so inspired at the, s at the same time. Mm. I wrote to Netflix straight away. Can I come and work for you? <laughs> you know, in some capacity, sometime, some, somewhere. Yeah, it's all about the, the story, isn't it? With that one, you know, I can see people watching and be like, oh, let's make a four-part thing. And like what Rollis said, it's just all about the story. It, ne it needed that long to tell it because it, mm. so, it was so great. I loved having both the genres of hip-hop and rock being told mm. simultaneously. Um, because that's something that you don't see so often. But I guess access is, is key, and with all going to start to make music documentaries, it's the relationship with the artist um, and filmmaker that seems to be at the centre of a lot of the great stories. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of... It's, I guess it's not that that recent now, but the, the Kendrick Lamar film, the Good Kid, Man City film, which was... Not Hello, Joseph. Yeah, and when it came out, I don't think it was that widely available because it was made basically something you had to go and see. Um, and it was a kind of installation piece, which I thought was very interesting in itself, and it was on two screens, and you, I think you can watch it on YouTube now. Um, but that felt really, really interesting because it was a good example of someone who just, they just obviously get each other so well. And it was an incredible representation of a city as well, which I think is something... Um, 
interested in myself in London and music and, and its kind of own associations. And that felt like a sort of a very, felt like no one else could really have made that film in quite the same way, you know, like it felt inherently sort of bound together. And it was, you know, Kendrick's not even in it, I don't think. And, and yet it's got so many bits of music in it, which are so amazing. Um, and it's made in a very interesting way. And it's a sort of quite complex, quite unexplained way. It uh, feels brand new as well. Which I, which I really like. And it's kind of architectural, going back to the city as well. Um, and just kind of going back to what I was saying about kind of relationships with people. And it's interesting that I... Th I mean, it's more to say what we think is good, but you look at the film that I think Khalil Joseph then made with Sampha mm. a year later, and that felt less interesting to me personally because it was it didn't have that same connection. That was an Apple-funded project with uh, Sampha. I think it was at 40 Minute, for those who haven't seen it. It's yeah. It's very beautiful, but I agree, lacks the sort of punch that the Khalil... Sort of intensity of something that maybe was a bit more of mm. a natural, natural meat, yeah. Rob, anything out there that you keep returning to? That's Years fun. on? That's... Uh, uh, I mean, I guess, obviously, like everybody probably in this room, I really loved the Oasis documentary because, A, I'm a super fan, but B, I really loved, like, by most standards or even, like, things that... What I liked about it was really weird. Like, if I was to make that film, I would say that, like, half of the archival in that film is probably unusable, like, if that were me. But I loved how they used all the art, like, even, like, the most unusable, like, <coughs> low-grade clips from that were, like, they, the way they, it was peppered in, in, like, a te in textures and stuff like that, I thought was really interesting. Um, but, uh, well, I don't know what else. I don't watch a lot of music documentaries. Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I think, Alex? Um, well, I was actually, went to a lot of the, like, Every Man do a music film festival, actually, which was in Birmingham was part of, but I went to a bunch of the other ones. Uh, it was more older stuff, though. Like I saw the Slits documentary, um, which was good in its in its own way and very different from there was a Nico one. Actually, wasn't a doc. It was a, actually a narrative film, which I didn't know when I started watching it. But it was also really great. But in terms of like new stuff, actually, I really like the Jimothy Lacoste thing that yeah. Bader did. It was a really good example of just like really uh, basing it around his personality and not having a sort of vision of what. a piece would be and then sort of trying to put him into it. It's just like, this is of someone who's already so um, unusual Jim on his own. Let's just a a a amplify that. Jimothy Lacoste, if you don't know, is an incredible uh, new voice from North London. He's got a very good music, fantastic new music videos and he's a sort of an 18-year-old character. And I think that we're, we're, we miss characters in, in sort of modern music industry often and they are the ones who kind of make for the best yeah, I'm films getting and tell the best stories. The whole time from big artists from labels but I'm just not necessarily interested in unless mm. it's some uh, I don't know, yeah, unless they're a character like all yeah. the best films we made obviously Oasis were massive as well as being great characters and having stories um, but yeah you need all of those. So I guess if anyone in the uh, room has any questions to rescue me from my chairing yeah. that would be <laughs> fantastic. Hello? I think there's a mic that we're waiting for. Great. Um, the, the talk was really inspiring in, in, in terms of new platforms and new forms, but we, are, we always talked about big names, you know, what, uh, and most of us, I believe, are here working with smaller scale artists, and I think it's a kind of struggle, and most of the production companies and funding bodies are like, okay, what, who is the name in the film, and um, would you be able to make a suggestion about that? Um, I mean, I think like what Alex just brought up, like with when I was making the film with Will Scott about Jimothy, Jimothy Lacoste doesn't necessarily have a huge following, but I think I got people on board because of how much of a character he was. And I think that some of the fa my favorite films that I've ever commissioned or made myself have been with artists that weren't necessarily big, but just had a really amazing story to tell. And, or just had a unique sort of perspective on life. And I think the way I sold that in is obviously you could show uh, the people who you know, make the decisions above me how interesting of a character Jimothy is. Like anything you showed him about Jimothy Lacoste, his personality and how strange and sort of uh, unique he was sort of comes through immediately. So I think um, it's all about the character, right? And like I think that even despite how big they are or, or uh, how big of a reach they have if, if, if they have a really unique story or just are a unique character in general. I think it's, you know, 
if you can somehow get that through to the commissioner, get that through to the people who are financing it, I think then you have, you know, that's the best way. Because then at the end of the day, you're not just making sort of an EPK about another artist, which a lot of these music docs, especially in the digital space, they come off as just like, they're just basically sort of electronic press kits for the artist. There's no tension, there's no like real, any sort of character development. So I think it's really about finding just unique personalities and that's across anything. That's not just in music. And if you know their story can, can help us look at the world in, in a new way through fresh perspective, that's maybe quite provocative or surprising that might speak to flashpoints in contemporary culture. You know, there's, there's I think if you can kind of focus on storytelling and, and how it fits in politically and socially, um, that could be a way of, of pitching it um, that might not focus so much on their status as an artist. I mean, a good example that I could give from Noises, we did a piece uh, a year or so ago, which was just Noisy Blackpool, um, which was just something, I don't know, someone forwarded me a thing and I found this really weird YouTube channel with these, with these kids on it from Blackpool, which did actually have some quite good numbers on it, nothing enormous, but it was enough to sort of make me interested. I won't go into the whole thing if you haven't seen it, but everybody who watched the channel just sort of like jaw hit the floor. It was just so, uh, it was just so wild that we were like, we have to at least go and investigate what this is. Cut long story short, we made a film about these people, which obviously if you ask your average person on the street, they have no idea there's even music in Blackpool, let alone um, a, a grime scene. <laughs> but not just, I look back and think, yeah, that was an interesting thing, I'm glad we made it, but it was actually the, the most viewed thing we've, we've ever done, and that's it globally as well, so more than any of the most famous artists we've ever worked with, which is you know, quite a lot of famous artists, but it had like really quickly got to like five million uh, views for, on YouTube for the doc, as well as various other sort of little clips. And I think it was just because it was, it was such a bizarre story that we, uh, no one was expecting. And whoever you were, whether you were into music or not, whether you knew anything about it or not, everyone sort of had the same reaction when you watched the first few minutes. So I guess trying to get it out of that just pure music world and having more of a general interest. And like you know, Rob says, not, not every band, you might really like them, but not every artist has got a really great documentary in them. You know, you might really like them yourself, but just interviewing them about their music and showing some, some of it is, is, is nice, but it's not necessarily going to be huge. Um, anyone else? Oh, sorry, Willow, do you want to, anything to add to that? Uh, no, that's not the next question. Blue? Hi. I've actually got two questions. So I was wondering uh, what you're seeing happen in the traditional sort of feature length historical archive heavy music documentary space that's really sexy and exciting and a bit different. And um, who are the amazing young women in the UK you're seeing coming up as directors in this genre? Rollo Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Woman director, there's someone called Stella Scott, who's really good. Oh, who, um, I did. <laughs> who I worked with, I did actually quite a, w a sort of weird, talking about brands, thinking about it, it's kind of a good example, it's a weird hybrid thing, so I directed a commercial, um, uh, several commercials for a big beer brand, the commercial comes out later this year, it features real people, and all the real people in it, we did sort of proper documentaries about, Stella did one of those, she's very talented. Mm. Um, that's an answer to that question. The second question may be better answered by Jackie, actually, about, about sort of feature length women. documentary. No, either one. Oh, I mean, women. Or probably, yeah, others. There's Jen Nickrew. Um, She's amazing. Simon Iconoclast. She did a film called Rebirth is Necessary Announced, which was amazing, um, about black culture and experience. Um, I love her. And then what was the other question? Feature docs, like cinematic feature of those. The space, like how archive, uh, you know, we've had so many sort of archive feature docs. And I, could, I could talk a bit about that. Just, I mean, I might be wrong, but I feel like when I was younger, that didn't, didn't really exist. Or maybe it existed. I, I feel like when I was a teenager or late teenager, it was like the second DVD of the like live concert might be like the band larking about mm -hmm. backstage or something. But like, of course, there were music docs, but they're always like massive artists. I don't know, whether well, you, you wouldn't have thought to see them in the cinema. So in a way, I don't know whether we're in a golden age now, but we certainly have had one recently. Obviously, people will definitely point to Amy. Or it felt like when Pulse really started knocking out all those big, great ones, Blur and LCD Sound System and 
all of those. And I think Netflix has definitely helped. Like, I never know with this whether it's the echo chamber thing or because I watch so many music docs that they always pop up in my thing. But I feel like, not just music docs, but just docs in general, I feel like if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I know that there'll be this service that is the one that everyone watches, or one of the ones everyone watches, um, what will it be full of? And you would assume it would just be trash and celebrity stuff, but maybe it's just my thing. But it feels like people are s much more talking about documentaries. And, um, and there's a lot of music ones on there. I can't think off the top of my head of loads, but there's loads of music docs on Netflix, that, you know, even like some kind of monster or Anvil or something, things like that that are on there that I think people might not have stumbled across um, before, but because they're in the documentaries bit and people might have watched, I don't know, World War Country or Making a Murder or whatever, like the big doc is at the time, um, I feel like it's a, it's a good time for f featured docs. Like probably people who are trying to make them, there's probably people in this room who are angry at me saying that, thinking it's so hard to make, but I feel like all docs are hard to get away and maybe if this was 20 years ago, they would just there wouldn't even be a thing. Like when people wouldn't even know that they would be interested in such a thing. But now it feels like it's a, it's a better time. Yeah, definitely. And it's always been hard, but it's it's always hard. But there's so many more platforms now. And what what was once you would have been told was niche is is no longer. You know, there's a platform for it now. So um, it's yeah. Uh, sorry, we've got to wrap it up. But um, Cosima Spender, uh, Sophie Lippman, uh, Lucy Luscom, Rain Allen Miller. <laughs> okay, um, so a question up there at the back, a lady at the back, with, oh, you're just doing your hair, um, the gentleman, <laughs> whoever can get there first. <laughs> Hello, um, I know a few of you fairly well, um, I, I used to work in music, uh, did a lot of content for people like MTV and ITV, Channel 4. But uh, in the last few years, I've been uh, producing virtual reality documentaries. Uh, one of them premiered here a couple of years ago called Indefinite. And um, that's kind of a lot of what I do now. Uh, it's about sort of other people inhabiting spaces. It's a lot about empathy. Um, and I'm intrigued to ask if any of you guys have had any experience in making VR music documentary or have a particular opinion on it or, or you know, if, if it's going to happen or whether you have any interest in making any VR docs in, in music? I haven't had an experience, um, but I always thought it would be amazing to recreate clubs of the past that were already nostalgic to experience through VR, but also have I introducing kind of real-life elements as well, so like smells and smells and s sounds and temperatures, and I always thought that would, could be a really amazing VR experience. Pets and pills. That's, yeah. Yeah. You know those uh, clubs that everyone bangs on about? It's so amazing if you were there. I've been to the Hacienda. I've been yeah, to CBGB's. Exactly. No one ever was, but no. <laughs> they could be in VR. I'm, I was first to admit I'm not, um, never at the forefront of like tech stuff. I'm always a little bit behind. Just worked out to use my phone. But, um, but I, did, I did recently try the new, is it Harmony? Is that what it's called? Like the live, I don't know if you know, it's like the first, supposedly the first sort of live music. Um, VR experience, is that what it's called? Melody. Well, the platform, Melody. yeah, Melody VR. Um, so I went to try that out, relatively um, sceptical. Not, not sceptical as in, I don't think this will work. I, it could be enormous, and I, I hope it is. Um, but just for a personal perspective, mainly because it's all based on live music. And I know sometimes it's sacrilegious when you say this amongst like music fans, but like I don't know that many music fans who watch live music that regularly. Or you might watch a clip of like, something, someone performed like a track on a big show, or they, they'd come back with a new track, but just to watch an entire gig, I don't know, very few people do that, I think, on a regular basis. So uh, we went to check it out, and I've got to say, it was really fun to, to do it, mainly because you can you move around the whole place, and um, the most fun bit, I guess, for me, was the fact you could have a bit where you were sort of like in the pit, and you could like look around, <laughs> and obviously straight away I was like looking at, there was some camera, people and I was like I wonder if it's anyone I know and I was like oh shit that's my mate <laughs> and he, was like, he was right there um, so I told him he needs to get it and he can just watch it, him filming the entire gig and see, see if he was any good but um, I thought it was actually fun but I still came back to the same conclusion that I wouldn't um, I can't imagine I think it is probably more aimed at like younger you know I think they were talking about aiming at younger viewers and also people who live in um, you know making it as like an experience where they do it live where like a bunch of fans can get together. And I thought it was actually really cool when they started explaining it. Like if you're a kid somewhere, you know, and either you can't get your parents to take you there or 
um, or you can't afford it, or you got no, they're not coming within hundreds of, of miles of you. Um, I thought that could be really fun if it's like a, a un, uh, group experience. But I'd be much more excited about probably what you're working on in terms of actual documentaries and a, and a deeper thing. I just probably don't know enough about it, so we should probably chat. <laughs> And um, yeah, so I think that's all we have time for, but we'll be around uh, if you've got questions for the guys outside. But thank you very, very much for coming um, on the sunny day outside. Yeah.